announcements or anything before we get started into our presentation? Okay, well, I have the great honor of, of welcoming my friend tonight. Um, so we have another great speaker, Paul Skowinski is here with us. He is an expert on aquatic plant taxonomy and authored The Aquatic Plants of Upper Midwest, a, photograph a photographic field guide to our underwater forests, which is now in its fourth edition. In addition to his outreach position at UWSB Lakes Extension, Paul teaches aquatic plant, plant tax at UWSB and has been working with aquatic ecosystems management for over 20 years. But today we're bringing them on land, <laughs> talking about plants up on, uh, on our land. Um, we're going to be focusing above water and Paul is an honorary board member and a past president of the Central Wisconsin Chapter of Wild Ones. Paul helped reignite actually our local chapter. So thank you for that leadership. Paul and I have frequently worked together on native plant um, garden installs and tours around Stevens Point. We are currently in the middle of installing six native rain or prairie gardens at schools in Stevens Point. We just finished the installs um, of a rain garden at Spash and Ben Franklin. And next year we'll be working with staff and students at Pods, the Point of Discovery School and McKinley Elementary. So if you, um, and if you've seen the large shoreline garden on the north side of Hipner Park, you can thank Paul for that, for the most part. He, there are a lot of partnerships in that, but um, Paul was did the design for that installation and put a lot of sweat and tears in that project too. In his own yard in Whiting, he's converted over 3,000 square feet of his yard to native plants. Paul has been a close friend and a mentor to me and has inspired me to continue to kind of make my, my yard a little more wild um, and make it more of a wildlife haven. So by the end of the presentation, I hope you become inspired to wild your yard even further if you already do some wilding um, and, and learn more about native plant species and go home with a few seeds for native plants. So um, help me welcome Paul Swinsky. <laughs> Um, cardinal flower is awesome. Thanks for bringing that. That's a really cool native plant. I'm not going to touch on that one particularly, but it's a beautiful plant. If you don't know it already, it's brilliant red and the hummingbirds really like it. So it's a really neat plant to have around. Um, <clears throat> I get asked to, to do talks on native plant landscaping for a lot of different targeted goals, including birds, butterflies, stormwater management, erosion control, all kinds of things. Cool thing about native plant landscapes is that they can easily provide more than one goal at the same time. And you can tweak the design a little bit and focus on birds and focus on butterflies or whatever you really want to target, but you are inadvertently going to do a lot more than just benefit birds or benefit butterflies. Uh, the Piffner Park Garden, there's butterflies all over the place. There's birds in there. Uh, ducks like to sit in there. Um, it's a goose deterrent. That was one of the goals of the city of Stevens Point. We would try to keep the geese off the trail. Um, it's preventing erosion along the shoreline, doing lots of things all at one time. So that's, that's part of the fun of using native plants in landscaping. So what we're really trying to do is we're asking the, we're trying to help the birds help us. We have a lot of issues out there in the, in the world right now that um, are bad for us. And the more that we do for things that are lower in the food web, birds or butterflies or whatever it might be, it's ultimately going to benefit us. And if we keep destroying lower levels of the food web, then it's ultimately going to come back and bite us. So uh, let's help the birds and they will in turn help us. The he a healthy habitat for birds is going to be a healthy human habitat as well. And when we're planting all these things in these native plant landscapes, they're doing a lot of things for us. They're, they're producing oxygen, they're cleaning water and storing water, they're producing topsoil, preserving topsoil, preventing erosion, they're cycling nutrients. And I would argue they're a stress reduction opportunity. If you've ever sat in an area and just watched the birds, you know that's a relaxing atmosphere. It's probably relaxing for the birds as well. If you prov provide a nice landscape for those birds, it's relaxing for them. They're happy there, they're comfortable there. Um, I don't know if anybody studies the mental health of birds, but I bet they feel pretty good when they're in a nice, happy birdscape rather than a, a, a big lawn or something that doesn't provide a lot of resources for them. Um, and certainly these landscapes provide habitat for an enormous amount of other organisms other than just birds. 
Another reason why we're, we're landscaping for birds, you probably have heard this statistic before, 2019, uh, Ken Rosenberg, who's at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, did a study and was kind of surprised to see we've lost 3 billion birds between 1970 and, and 2019. Uh, which is representing about a third of the continental bird total population. So that's a huge and kind of scary statistic that we've lost so many birds in the continent. Right now we have a lot of what I would consider backward thinking landscapes. Um, the way that people often maintain their landscapes, we have a, a reflection of our culture of neatness. We, we are obsessed with things being just so Lots of very clean lines, lawns getting mowed every weekend, whether it needs it or not, um, plants in just the right place. And if it moves over there, we're gonna dig it up and put it back where, where it belongs, where we put it in the first place. Or if a new plant shows up as a volunteer, we pull it out as a weed, even though that may be a beneficial plant as well. It's just, um, we need to accept a little bit of that wildness where mother nature does move things around a little bit and it's okay. Um, so we need to worry, or we need to start accepting that more, that a little bit of wild is okay. It could still be intentional. It can still be beautiful. Um, a little bit of wilding is all right. So this is an example of an overly neat landscape, I would say, in my opinion. Uh, this is a shoreline garden in central Wisconsin, and they have eliminated all the vegetation on the property and along the shoreline, the shallow water plants, emergent plants, but they did put some steel cattails back in. <laughs> and you'll notice in the left, they put a birdhouse up. They took all the bird food away, but then they put up a birdhouse. Not sure if that birdhouse is being used, but think about taking a human family and giving them a shed and putting them into a hundred acre parking lot and telling them, Here's your new home. Everything you need is right here. Um, it's hard, hard for a bird to survive if you've eliminated all of its resources. So a, a better option, sticking with the shoreline theme, would be something like this. This is a, um, a diverse mixture of native plants along a shoreline, grasses, sedges, forbs. Um, it's an example of a three-tiered habitat where there's a low ground cover layer. There's also short trees over there, the white cedars over on the side of the house. And then there's the large canopy trees like the willow here. So it provides multiple levels in the habitat, which is really the most beneficial wildlife habitat you can you can get. It's some some species are going to like a low growing prairie. For example, you'd see meadow larks out in a very vast prairie. But if you want to see other species that need trees, maybe woodpeckers or things like that, then you're going to want more than just one level in the garden. Um, I had the pleasure of actually eating lunch on this porch. This was a lake monitoring volunteer that I was, I was visiting. But um, it was wonderful just to listen to the birds right there in the garden and listen to the waves along the shoreline. Um, as I said at the beginning, that was really designed as a shoreline management Tool. They wanted to prevent erosion along the shoreline from boat wakes, but they're providing a lot of habitat for birds and for insects and for frogs and all kinds of other things. All those other results that were not necessarily the, the initial target, but it's doing a lot more. Here's a giant bird feeder. You might think of a bird feeder as a cylindrical piece of plastic with a bunch of black whale sunflower seed inside, but this is also a bird feeder. This is at our, our old house. Um, all those black-eyed Susans and the bone set and the blue vervain and the brown-eyed Susan in the foreground, those are all going to provide insects throughout the whole year that the birds are eating. They're providing seeds, certainly at the end of the summer into the fall, but birds are eating a lot more than just seed. Certainly when they're re rearing their young, they're using mostly insects, not seeds, to feed their young. So this is providing food for them year-round, even into the winter, those seed heads are still containing some seeds. They're going to be in there picking away at the seed heads. They're also going in there pulling apart leaves, old dead shriveled up leaves that have a little grub inside. They're finding those and they're finding shelter from the cold winter winds and, and they're, they're using that garden year round. So it is important to leave that in place also for the birds throughout the winter. And I can tell you from, from my property, as, as Susan mentioned, we have over 3,000 square feet of our lawn that's been converted to native plants, uh, different kinds of plantings. 
And I can stand by the living room window and watch the finches out there in the in February. They are just going crazy over all the hyssop and the different coneflower seed heads and things that are standing in the winter. Um, they use it year round. So <laughs> I want to show you the, the preparation of, of kind of my crown jewel of my property, our rain garden, which is my favorite part of the property. When we moved in, the whole property was long. There was nothing but uh, there was a, a dying Norway maple and a dying Norway spruce, and the rest of it was just grass. And I'm not a big fan of mowing lawn. So we, I think it was about 10 days after we moved in, I started tarping things and smothering grass. But this is in the front yard. Notice all of my neighbor's lawns, also very clean, just lawn, not a whole lot more going on. And we knew there was going to be some concern in the neighborhood when we started tearing things up. So we decided we we're gonna be real careful about the front yard, the backyard. Yeah, we can kind of work on that whenever we can, it can be as wild as it wants to be and nobody really notices it too much. But in the front yard, people are going to be watching. They're gonna be watching really closely. So we decided let's, let's carefully plan this out. We're going to draw it out with paint. I had a, a friend help me who had a tractor so he could help me with some of the earth moving so it could go a little faster. And we raised all the plants that we needed in pots in the backyard. So we actually put this in in August, which is not the best time to put a giant brand new garden in, in the middle of the heat of the summer. But most of the plants in these pots were ready to bloom. So by the time we put them in the ground, give them a week or two, they're already flowering. And so the neighbors were seeing flowers right away, which allowed us to get a lot more buy-in from the neighbors. Well, this is actually pretty cool. This isn't just a pile of weeds or something. So um, here's the first day. This is about the time when neighbors started stopping and taking pictures. <laughs> I'm wondering what the heck was going on with these new nuts that just moved in. Um, so the, the tractor is, is, has excavated the rain garden there. There's going to be a path where the tractor is. We put in a couple of river birch trees. There's a berm that we use soil from the rain garden excavation to create. There's also one on the left side that you can't see. We mix some compost in. Um, there's a whole lot going on there. There's going to be a rock uh, border around the garden. And this is two months later. So things are already looking garden-like to the average person. So there, we had pretty, pretty good acceptance from the neighborhood, but all of the water in here, uh, all of the water from half of the house and the garage all drained to this one spot, one big downspout, 1100 square feet of roof and on the garage and the house, all going to that one spot. You can see it rained pretty good that day. So there's a big puddle in the rain garden. It only lasts for about 20 minutes after the rain stops. It soaks right through. So it doesn't hold water for very long. But you can see purple coneflowers and black-eyed Susans blooming in October, which is not normal. But they were, again, in pots until August, so they were a little bit off schedule there. And then this is the uh, 10 months after we started. Plants are growing really well. One year after we planted, things are really well established. It looks like it's been there for years. The only reason it looks so good after one year is because we used all plugs, potted plants, we didn't use seed. Seed takes a lot longer. It's, it's an option, but um, I'm a big, big fan of plugs if you can, depending on the size of your project. So again, you can see the water flying out of the downspout there hitting the rocks to absorb some of the energy. Um, and then there's a path that leads through it. And that's looking from the rooftop down on the garden the next day. Everything's looking real happy. So all of these plants are natural bird feeders. We see this picture here and we think, boy, this, this American elderberry is uh, producing all this fruit. Cedar waxwings are gonna love this. Robins are gonna love this. And they do, but that elderberry is producing food all year long. It's producing shelter all year long. It's producing nesting materials that the birds can harvest all year long. And it's much more than just the fruit. And think about density of shrubs and trees too. If you're planting for birds, if you've ever watched birds come to your feeder, 
they like to grab a sunflower seed and then they fly off to the nearest dense cover, right? They go to a spruce tree, a cedar tree, someplace where they feel safe, where they can get out of the winter wind, feel safe from predators. So um, density is important too. And the average gardener who puts in a plant, four feet of wood chips, another plant, that doesn't provide a lot of dense cover for the birds. They're not gonna feel as comfortable in there. There's still resources there. There's still some bugs, there's still some seeds, there's still some cover for them, but they're gonna be feel, feel more comfortable if there's some more dense cover available to them. So why native plants? Can't we just plant anything from anywhere in the world? Could, and there's gonna be some value no matter what you plant. But a lot of non-native plants are selected as they're cultivated, they're selected for certain things that we, we see as beneficial. They are often less desirable to insects when we choose them for certain things. When we change the color of a flower or we change the color of a leaf. In this case, we've got this Norway maple that is often bred to be this really deep purple. And people plant Norway maples specifically because they want the purple. It's a really interesting looking tree, very cool color, but that purple color is from a high concentration of anthocyanin pigments, which are really bitter. So things don't like eating them. And we see this on spireas, we see this on barberries, we see this on maples, we see it on a lot of different things where it's bred to have that color. And gardeners will often look at the plant on their landscape and they're like, this is great. There isn't a single hole in any of these leaves. There's none of the edges are chewed. There's no damage whatsoever. But what we've done, is basically created a completely ecologically non-functional space where the plants are not there at the bottom of the food web to provide the energy to the next level, to the insects. And the insects take that energy to everything else, birds, reptiles, ultimately humans. Um, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to plant things that have no food value to insects. It's, it, it's pleasing to our eye that it's an interesting color but it has very little function ecologically. Um, this this uh, statistic here is from some of Doug Ptolemy's work. Um, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with Doug, Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope are his two uh, popular books on native landscaping. And he was looking at uh, maples in particular. If we just plant, we have, in Wisconsin here, we have various native maples. We can go find a, a red maple, a silver maple, a sugar maple, whatever. Those are all native maples. There's also Japanese maple, which is pictured here. And that's common in the horticulture trade. This is a scarlet red or whatever they call it. Um, and in the case of the maples, he found that these non-native species in the genus Acer, maples, were producing less than a third of the caterpillar abundance that our native ones were. So you might think, I'm gonna plant a maple and it's gonna do good, but planting a maple that belongs in our area is a whole lot better than planting a maple from halfway around the world that does not have all of those ecological relationships that have developed over millions of years with these different insects. So it's important to provide the plants that actually grow here naturally. Just because it's in a different, uh, the same genus does not mean that it has the same value to the insects or the birds or the other creatures that live here. He also looked at chickadees in Washington, DC with a, a PhD student of his. And they were looking at different urban lots within Washington, DC that had a various uh, varying degrees of non-native species in their landscape. And they found that the, the chickadees couldn't even reach a replacement rate. That is where the chickadees are reproducing as fast as they're dying. If the plants, the non-native plants in the landscape made up more than about a third of the landscape. If you had a population of, of a, or a landscape dominated by non-native plants, the, the chickadees couldn't even reach that replacement rate. There was nothing they could do to, they, they couldn't reproduce successfully enough to even maintain their population. They could only grow their population if there was less than a third non-native species of plants on the landscape. And some of that is just because they they would not breed in certain lots. There were not the resources available to them to create a nest um, and successfully hatch out young. So if you want to put in a native plant garden, where should you put it? Well, the fun thing about native plants is they can go anywhere. 
it's the right place and the, the right plant in the right place. An old, old horticultural slogan, as long as you put the right plant in the right place, it'll thrive. So we have native plants that are good for landscaping that can tolerate wet or dry or hot or sandy or shady or whatever you might have. You just have to put some planning into it in the beginning, make sure you're picking the right plants for that landscape. So an easy low hanging fruit would be an area that's wet or difficult to grow grass. If you have an area of your lawn that you just struggle to get the grass to grow in, stop trying to grow grass there. Try to put something else there that actually wants to grow in that spot. Maybe you have a tree with a bunch of low branches and you get scraped in the forehead every time you go mow the lawn through there. Maybe put something else underneath the tree so you don't have to mow there. Speaking from experience at our old house. <laughs> I said, that's enough. I'm not doing this anymore. You can't get scratched anymore. Um, also near a window or patio, somewhere where you can appreciate it all the time, where you can stand by the window and watch the finches out there in January eating all your seed heads, or a patio where you can sit and listen to the bird song in the morning. Um, don't put it on the other corner of the lot where you can't see it and hear it. Put it somewhere close where you can actually enjoy it to the fullest extent. And think about putting it next to a downspout where you can create a rain chain or a cascade of saucers where it's a bunch of bird baths and you can have the running water sound that's relaxing to us and also attractive to birds. They can have bird baths there. They're actually getting flushed out every time there's a rain. So it's flushing out parasites or diseases or mosquito larvae or whatever might be in there. It's good if you do have a bird bath of any kind to refresh that water every couple of days, make sure it's not being used by 300 birds before you change it out. Um, so putting it next to a downspout can be a really good option. So I wanna talk about weeds because this is a big issue. When you start a new garden, uh, the reason why a lot of people don't start a new garden or they get frustrated when they do is weed competition. It's a big issue when you start a new garden. And you have weed seeds in your soil, guaranteed. There's nothing that you can do about that. They are there and they are ready to grow as soon as you give them a chance. So you have to either control those weeds by pulling them out or however you want to control them or outsmarting. And I try to do the outsmarting part because I don't have time to be pulling them all out all the time. So um, one thing I want to mention first before I talk about outsmarting them is uh, well, I'll go back to that other slide. So this is one of the, the first native plantings that I did. I did this from seed because seed was much cheaper. And I said, well, that's easy. I just have to mix this with some sand and I'll just go chuck it around in the yard and it's going to be great. It's going to be this giant wildflower patch and there's going to be all these awesome birds in there. It's going to be awesome. It wasn't awesome. <laughs> this was the next spring. So I threw all these seeds out in the fall. I think I spent about 200 bucks on this seed mix. And I went out in the spring and every day I was looking, well, watching for my yellow cone flowers to sprout out and all my other cool stuff. And I ended up seeing plantains and dandelions and black nightshade and sheep sorrel and crabgrass and all the things that I didn't want. And I thought, well, what the heck? I put all these seeds down. I, I stratify them the way I was supposed to. But the problem is these weed seeds, they sprout early. So they outcompete the native plants. Um, they grow faster than the native plants do. Most of the, these things we're, we're planting are perennials. They tend to focus on their root system more than they focus on the above ground biomass, at least for the first year. These guys are all, they're programmed to just grow tall and, and tall and fast and go to seed and that's it. So they tend to be very strong competition for weeds. So I ended up smothering that again and putting plugs in. Um, I got so frustrated. And I, I'm just impatient when it comes to gardening too. But one of the things that I noticed in that same planting, this is just a few feet away from the other picture, I actually have a couple bone set plants here growing and there's a black eyed Susan back there. And in between, there's all this little stuff. And I started pulling this at first and then I thought, I don't even know what this is. Maybe I should just leave this in there, figure out what it is first. Now, this is Veronica serpulifolia, which is a thyme-leaved speedwell. It's not a native species, it's an introduced plant, but uh, it wasn't really causing any harm. And it made me think twice about all this time I was spending pulling weeds because this plant was forming a nice ground cover, forming these nice little flowers. There were little bees and flies on there. And, 
things were using it. It was shading the base of my bone set and other plants and kind of shading it from the hot sun, conserving a little bit of moisture. And it was preventing worse weeds from coming in. So just because something volunteers doesn't necessarily mean you have to yank it out right away. It might just be a volunteer that actually has some beneficial properties and it's okay to leave it alone. Um, in our yard right now, and actually in our neighbor's yards, the weeds that grow are things like smooth blue aster, black eyed Susan, <laughs> milk weeds, yeah. all kinds of things blow over into the neighbor's yards and, and throughout our yard. And <laughs> there's times when we've gone, we've gone on vacation for a week, we come back and the lawn is kind of tall and there's black eyed Susan's blooming in the lawn. And there's, there's asters growing and I, I kind of killed me to mow the lawn after that because I'm cutting all these things off. Um, I actually mow around some patches of black eyed Susan now. Uh, they just sit there right in the middle of the lawn and then I cut them off at the end of the year. Um, but yeah, sometimes you just, just leave them alone and just think about, do I need to invest this time pulling these out or maybe these are providing some benefit as well. Um, using potted plants are so much faster. The results are so much better, so much better acceptance from anyone else who's coming and maybe judging your planting. Um, this plant on the left is a smooth blue aster that I grew from seed that's in a, a plug form now in a two and a half inch pot. I just took it out of the pot for the picture. On the right are landsleaf coreopsis plants in those plastic pots that were grown in a nursery. The one on the left is a coconut fiber pot that I had seeded with landsleaf coreopsis the previous fall. I left it outside all winter long and it just germinated when it was ready in the spring. So that's an easy way you can do it. Just put it outside when it's ready to grow, it'll start growing. But look at the size difference between one that just naturally germinated in May and one that's been growing in a greenhouse for two months and is now eight inches tall with 30 leaves on it and a big root system. That's a really strong competitor for the weeds that would be growing around it as you put it in the ground. If you put those little coreopsis in the ground or they're growing from seed in place wherever you spread the seed, one of the biggest challenges people have is knowing what's a weed and what isn't. Because now all my plants are an inch tall. Well, what's a good inch tall plant? What's the bad inch tall plant? I don't know which ones to pull out. Um, so if you have all your plants, all your good plants are eight inches tall and all your weeds are one inch tall, it makes it really easy to know this is my good one. I need to pull these little ones out. So that can be really helpful as you're, as you're gardening. If you're not experienced with plant identification, knowing what to pull and what not to pull. So plugs are, <laughs> they're expensive. They're uh, 250 to $5 a piece, or you can grow them yourself, which is a lot cheaper. Um, but they're so fast, the results are so much better. You'll, you'll feel much better about it. Your results will come much quicker. You'll be proud of the garden instead of having a lot of weeds the first year or two. Um, and uh, one of the other disadvantages is that they require a lot of water. These are big plants with fairly small root systems. You've got a lot of biomass above ground. It's sitting out there in July. Maybe it's been in the ground for a few weeks and you get a hot day with a bunch of wind. It sucks a lot of moisture out of that plant and there just isn't enough root system to provide the water to replace all that water that's being lost above ground. So you do have to water them a bunch and count on watering them at least for a few weeks, if not the whole rest of the season anytime they look thirsty because they're gonna need some help depending on the size of the plug that you put in. You can also cut part of it off to try to reduce water loss. Um, there are options there, but the seeds, they're very inexpensive and they only need watering early on because they tend to grow the root system accordingly to supply the water to the above ground portion as they grow through the season. So they don't need a lot of watering later, but they're often outcompeted by weeds and they're very slow to establish. So here's a bunch of plugs that I had grown. You can see a couple of them. I hadn't quite gotten around to planting them in a timely fashion. So I had things blooming right in the pots. Um, but you can, you can create a garden that looks really good and accepting to people in a very short amount of time if you have plants growing in pots. This is a butterfly milkweed seedling 20 days after seeding it into a tray. And it's a good illustration of just how much root system some of these native plants have. This is an incredible root for such a tiny plant. You can see the two seed leaves are up there, and then there's a couple of true leaves that are just forming in the middle there. This plant 
it's only an inch tall, but the, the root system is probably six inches tall, right? six inches deep. And that's the way a lot of these native perennials grow, especially dry soil species like butterfly weed. They develop a long root system before they grow a lot above ground because they want to be able to transport enough water up to the, to the leaves. So you do have to be patient when you grow some of these. Unless you put them in as plugs, then you can have much faster results. So getting to that outsmarting part, I prefer to smother plants. I don't do a lot of herbicide preparation. I like to just smother them with a black tarp or with a big rubber sheet, something like that. And I'll leave it on there for a month or six weeks or so if I have that much time. And when you pull that off, you have this big wide open space. It's a big wide open bit of soil full of weed seeds that are ready to grow. And as soon as that intense light hits that, those seeds, they are stimulated to germinate and they're gonna go crazy. So when I started pulling these tarps off and I thought, I, I know what's gonna happen. I've seen this happen before. What can I do to try to keep those seeds covered so that they're not all germinating and competing with my native plants? So what I decided to do was add about a half inch, like a, a tarp's worth of compost, weed-free compost if you can get it, um, right over the top as soon as I take the tarp off. So basically I'm still smothering out the light source. So they're not seeing that intense light and I can plant directly into that and continue blocking out those weed seeds so I don't have so much competition. So I, I get my compost from Busy Bee Compost on 51 in Mosinee. He sells it by the bag or the cubic yard and he'll deliver it if you need to. Um, but what I've got illustrated here is there's my fancy sun, there's gray soil, and then the, the yellow is just representing the top layer of soil where there's a lot of light and there's some weed seeds in there. So when I take the tarp off and I put down a layer of compost, weed-free compost or as close as you can get, then I've got this layer on top that's well lit that doesn't have a lot of weed seeds. And so I'm able to plant things into it that don't have a lot of competition. The plants thrive that much more because they're not competing for resources from those weed seeds. And it allows them to really thrive and grow very quickly and establish a new garden with minimal maintenance. Um, Susan mentioned a lot of the things that we've been working on over the, the past few years are with schools. And I don't want to take on the responsibility of going to every one of these schools myself and weeding all of these gardens. And a lot of the staff don't really want to do that much either. They're willing to do some, but they don't want to go out there every week and weed the whole thing. So it's really important to find a way that we can minimize that maintenance component. And this has worked really well for the various school gardens that we've put in. And I do this at home as well. So this is what it looked like in my yard. This Again, this is like 10 days after we moved in. I said, yeah, 1,500 square feet of the lawn, I think, can come out today. So we started tarping, and uh, this this is, a, I think, about five weeks after we tarped. I started pulling it back and putting the compost layer on. So this is a pretty big area. This is a big chunk to bite off. I wouldn't ex encourage you to use uh, 1,500 square feet in your first garden. Don't, don't do that. It's too big. Uh, most likely, you're going to say, well, I can't afford plugs for 1,500 square feet because they cost four times as much as seed. Well, I'd say then cut your garden size by four and use plugs because it's gonna go much faster. Uh, and then next year, do another one, another quarter of it if you want, but it's so much, so such better results when you use plugs. And when you put these plugs in, uh, keeping them moist for at least a few weeks is good. And after that, anytime they look thirsty, if you're getting rain every few days, they're gonna be fine. But if you've got a, a week where it's hot and dry and windy, they're going to need some help. So make sure that you're able to provide them with some water throughout the season while they establish their root systems. And use dense groupings. Against, again, that density is important for the birds to find good shelter in there. And color drifts can be really nice to combine aesthetic pleasing value to eco ecological value. Um, when you have a specialist insect, think about a monarch, if you want, with a milkweed. They can easily move from one milkweed to the next. If they eat all the leaves off of one, they can easily move to another one. It's also very pleasing to the eye to have a, a drift of color. So if you want to put in something like blazing stars, put a whole bunch of them that just sort of weave their way through the garden. It just encourages your eye to move through the garden. Uh, it's a common landscaping um, principle. 
and don't use pesticides. I don't think most of you would probably be using pesticides in your garden, but if you're trying to treat a plant for insects and then the birds eat your poisoned insects, that's obviously no good for the birds. So uh, I probably don't have to hit that point home too much with this crowd here, but pesticides are in general not good. And uh, if you're if you're putting in a garden even on one side of your property and you're using pesticides on the other side, you still could have some impact on, on birds and, and things in your garden on the other side. So try to avoid pesticide use around the property if you can. And keep year-round interest in mind as well. Things like asters are some of the last blooming species that we have even um, just a couple of weeks ago. There were still New England asters and frost asters blooming out there on the landscape. They provide color and nectar sources into the, into the late fall, and they provide a seed source into the fall as well. Um, things like this winterberry holly produce red berries that stand all winter long. So it provides a really cool texture and color against the white snow all winter. And then one day, probably while you're at work and you don't get to see it, the cedar waxwings come in and they destroy all the berries on your entire crop of winterberry. This has happened, personal experience again. Um, it's awesome. It was awesome to see them in there, but it always happened when I was at work and I would get home and there'd be no berries left in my winter berries. I didn't get to see the, the cedar waxwings at all. But it's a great uh, late winter food source for a lot of birds. So I really like that one. It does need a little bit more moisture. I haven't been able to grow it at my, my house now in whiting. It's just too sandy and dry. So I haven't been able to get the, the winter berry to grow. Uh, and make sure you leave those dead stems standing. There's again, lots of things in there. Even when the plants are dead, there's still a lot of things in there. There's the seed, there's the nesting materials, there's cover, there's insects in there, there's leaf litter. Um, all th things that birds need throughout the winter time. So I cut them back generally right as the frost is going out of the soil. I'll go in and I'll cut my plants back to maybe eight inches tall. And then I'll take that, that stuff over to the compost yard. But I leave it there all winter long. We like to share our garden. This is the rain garden. This is the first summer, full, first full growing season. Um, this is my daughter. She was five at the time. And... All of our neighbors were very pleased with the garden by this time. They thought this is really cool. Uh, this, I, we, they did not expect it to look this colorful after the first year. And even so, they tended to compliment us from their driveway or from the front doorstep. They weren't close to the garden, so they couldn't appreciate the amount of life that was going on in this garden. And I thought, you know, if I can't get them to come right into the garden, Nobody's going to turn down a vase of fresh flowers from a five-year-old girl in butterfly shorts. <laughs> so my daughter, we went to the store. We got five vases for the neighbor on each side, three across the street. And we made a bouquet of fresh cut flowers out of the rain garden. And she delivered them to each house. And we said, you know what? When your flowers die, bring your vase back. We'll refill it with new flowers all summer long. They loved it. And I thought, well, this is great because they're not getting into the garden, but their garden is actually going right into their house. And they're getting to see these different flowers and these different textures and things right on their dining room table or wherever they put the space. Um, so we've done some other things like that with uh, rear rearing monarchs and things. We provide um, aquariums with screen lids and we raise monarch uh, milkweeds in pots and we have kids around the neighborhood come and harvest their own milkweed cater or monarch caterpillars from the milkweeds in the garden and it's another way to kind of take the garden back home with these different families. So this is a, an example I wanted to show from uh, Madison Elementary. This is on Maria Drive on the northwest side of town. This is what uh, one of the first projects that Susan and I worked together on. Uh, 300 square feet, we use 300 plugs. I typically recommend one plug per square foot. It's a fairly tight density but it allows the garden to grow together after one growing season. And it basically smothers out its own weeds. And at that point, all you have to do is weed around the outside because the plant is so uh, planting is so dense throughout that there isn't enough light to really grow weeds inside. So it really minimizes the maintenance. Plus there's that compost layer on there. So the amount of weeding necessary was just a matter of a couple hours a year to weed this garden. But this is on May 18th. We had eight volunteers. We transformed this from turf into what you see here in about two hours with eight people. Sod cutter to take the grass off, put that on a trailer, 
Uh, Marcus from Busy Bee backed a trailer right up to the spot, dumped it right into our spot. We raked it out, planted all those things about two hours time. And three months later, it looked like this. The goal was to have this looking good by the first day of school because this is the turnaround where everybody comes in, drops off their kids. They drive around the garden here and come out on the other side. And we wanted to make sure that when people come in here to drop off their kids or they're sitting there after school, some of them sit there for 40 minutes before the kids get out of school. I'm, I can't, I don't have that kind of time, but sometimes they're there that early and they have nothing to do, but either they're on their phone or they're looking around and they're either judging this garden saying, this is really cool or boy, that's ugly. So we wanted to make sure that they were saying, boy, this is really cool. Uh, it was in full bloom. We had the hyssop and the black-eyed Susan, the milkweeds and other things growing, blooming, providing a lot of shelter for birds, seed sources for birds in the fall uh, after just a few months time. So again, it's an illustration of how fast plugs can turn a turf landscape into something completely different. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was some recommended plants. If you're just getting started out, creating a, a small native plant garden. Uh, we have dry soils around here. We have wet soils around here. Um, Anne has nice moist soils over on the west side of the river over there. Whiting and plover, we're in sand, right? You might as well just go to a beach. That's pretty much what my lawn is, just beach sand. So one of the things I really like is nodding onion. This is a small plant that's only about a foot, foot and a half tall. It doesn't get eaten by deer or rabbits. That's a big, big plus. Uh, smells really nice, especially when it gets, when it starts to seed itself and it's has a, a few extras along your sidewalk or something. You go by with a string trimmer, it smells like onions. Kind of cool. Um, but it's a beautiful plant, attracts a lot of small bees and flies to it, produces a lot of seed. The seed heads stay standing throughout the winter. So you can see them sticking above the snow. You can harvest the seeds right off, right out of the out of the winter. Just grab them in February if you want to stick them in a pot, and you don't have to stratify them really. They already uh, Mother Nature takes care of that. Grab them right off the seed head and just put them into a pot, and you can grow them inside. Um, very easy to grow from seed. Very versatile and can take the hottest, driest conditions you got. So I really like that one for dry soil and for borders, borders around a, a planting, along a sidewalk or a walkway. They don't really flop over and get in the way of stuff. Um, and they provide this deer resistant, rabbit resistant sort of fence or barrier around the rest of your planting. So I like to think it deters things from coming in and eating other things that are tastier. Maybe, maybe not. Um, Ohio spider ward is a, a brilliant blue and it blooms in the morning, closes up at lunchtime and you don't see it again until the next morning. So that's it's kind of neat that way. Blooms for about a month and then sometimes you'll get a second period of blooms in the late summer as well. Um, really cool plant, just a really, really neat yellow and blue color to it. Butterfly milkweed is used by monarchs. We have about a dozen species of milkweeds in the state. Butterfly mil milkweed is, is a less common one, but still fairly common. It has a brilliant orange flower head, typically grows to about two feet tall. So it's another shorter one you can put along the borders of a planting where it's not gonna get too tall and, and flop its way out on the lawn or a walkway. The cone flowers, I like to use both of these. So pr pale purple cone flower is, is native to Wisconsin. It's actually a threatened species here. Uh, beautiful plant, the finches and other birds love going up on the seed heads and tearing the seeds out of there before you get to them. Um, purple cone flower is not native to Wisconsin. It's native to the Midwest, uh, Illinois and Iowa, Southern Minnesota. It's very close here. And in my opinion, I, I use it a lot um, because I figure with climate changing, it's going to move its way here anyway. It's going to move its way northward like many things are already doing. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those gateway plants, I guess you could call it, where people who are into gardening but not necessarily native plant gardening, they know purple coneflower or they know the genus name Echinacea. Same thing with Rudbeckia or Liatris or Aster. They know these names. And so when you're getting somebody into native plant gardening, they're more willing to try something that they recognize as familiar. I know echinacea. I'm willing to plant some of that because I already, I've already grown echinacea before. I've grown asters before. And so I use that one a lot for that reason, but also just it's extremely attractive. 
it blooms for a long time. It has a ton of benefits to insects and to birds. It has a big fibrous root system that holds soil together. It has a lot of different properties that make it a really good landscaping species. And then rattlesnake master is a, is a conversation starter. It's just a really bizarre looking plant, very unique uh, in the carrot family, believe it or not, it doesn't look anything like a carrot, but it is truly in that family. And it has these big balls of flowers, so a big as in like uh, three quarters of an inch to an inch maybe across. Um, produces these very large seeds and produces a lot of bird food. Very interesting species. If you have more moist soil, I really like Bev's sedge. It's a, a grass-like species with this interesting seed head on it. It's got very delicate leaves on it, only gets to about two feet tall. I liked using it in rain gardens and anywhere that there's a little bit of extra moisture. The birds like to come down and grab the leaves off because they're, they're very delicate, they're easy to tear off. They like to harvest those and they go make nests out of them and they'll eat the seed heads. Columbine, of course, is good for hummingbirds uh, and hummingbird moths. And it's just a, an all around really interesting flower, popular with insects as well. And then Meadow Blazing Star is one of my favorite things of all time for, um, for native plant landscaping because of the way that it attracts monarchs. There's nothing that attracts monarchs like Meadow Blazing Star does. And you can see that in the photo here. Um, we've had up to nine monarchs at once on one Meadow Blazing Star in our yard. Uh, they are so attracted to it. My daughter can just walk up and just pick them right off the plant. And a lot of times you'll see multiple males on there at one time, which is really unusual because male monarchs tend to be territorial. But for whatever reason, they're getting drunk on something and they're all happy to live together on, on the metal blazing star. So I always have some of that around. Anytime there's any kind of focus on butterflies, um, definitely put that one in there. But then when it goes to seed, the finches will come and they'll grab all those seeds off. Uh, it's usually a race between you and the birds to, to harvest that seed at the end of the season. And then uh, a few others, New England Aster is a really nice one. As I mentioned before, it, it blooms late into the season. So it's got a, a very nice late, sec late season nectar source for migratory insects like monarchs and painted lady butterflies, other things that are fueling up at the end of the season. Uh, it does get a little bit tall. So you might find that it grows to be four and a half feet tall, like on, on Anne's property where it's moister. Uh, it might get to four and a half or five feet tall and it gets kind of floppy. It gets sort of skinny and floppy, gets maybe four or five flowers at the top, which is cool. But if you if you cut it back in early July to just about six or eight inches tall, by the end of the season, then it'll grow to about a two and a half foot bush and it'll have 50 flowers on it instead of five. And it won't flop over. So if you're using this along a walkway or somewhere where you don't want a five foot tall plant laying down, after a rainstorm or a windstorm, that's a way to kind of manage this, this species to produce more color and a plant that won't blow over. Bottle gentian is, is just, the blue color is just amazing. I, my favorite color, so I can't go wrong with bottle gentian. But the coolest thing about that one is that it's, those flowers never open up more than that. Bumblebees are the pollinators of, of bottle gentian. Some of, some of you look like maybe you've seen bumblebees pollinating this plant before. So it takes a big bumblebee species to be able to push its way into that flower. It's open on the end, but something pretty strong has to go shove their way in between those petals and get inside. And once they're inside, it closes back up. So you'll walk past your bottle gentian and there'll be one flower that's just shaking around and vibrating it's because there's a bumblebee inside. And then you'll see it, it opens up at the end and then this big bee comes flying out the end. So it's just kind of cool to watch. And then Joe Pieweed, is a, a fairly big species. This can be this can get to be six or seven feet tall. One established clump might have 40 stems in it. It can be a pretty big, impressive plant. Um, but it's really cool. It's just an accent plant in a in the middle of a garden. Just it really gets your attention. It's a really attention-getting large perennial. Provides a huge amount of these big fluffy pink flowers, and then a lot of seed after that for a lot of bird food and nesting material. Um, also easy to grow from seed and fairly resilient, um, even if your soil is, is only somewhat moist, you can usually get Joe Pieweed to, to thrive there. So some of my suggestions. Um, at that point, I think I've talked as long as I was supposed to, or perhaps a little longer. Um, 
And someone can help me identify this. I think it's a juvenile sparrow. Am I correct on that? Yeah, I think so. So this is on a cup plant at our old house. Um, and I, I wanted to mention cup plant real quick because this is a really cool plant. Although if it's a, a wet area with a lot of sun, cup plant can be pretty aggressive. It's a, it's a nine, 10 foot tall plant, really big. The leaves can be a foot long on each side. And uh, it does spread pretty readily by seed and the clumps will continue growing uh, outward as well. But it's really cool because the leaves are fused on both sides. So there's a leaf over here and they come together and they form this cup right here. And it's full of water after a rainstorm. So you see birds going down there and getting a drink. I've seen gray tree frogs sitting in those cups after a rainstorm. Um, so it's just a really unique plant and the goldfinches just go nuts over the flowers. Once they go to seed, they're in there just tearing them up. And again, I was always trying to get seed from my cup plants, um, but they would always get to it before me. So a cool plant to have, but I would recommend being careful about planting that one unless you're in a drier area or in a part shade type environment. You don't want to give it a, a perfect environment to thrive in because it'll thrive too much. And then you're going to be trying to dig it up. All right, so that's all I have, but I'll take questions if there are some. Where's the easiest way to find these plants besides in the wild? Yeah, so more native plant nurseries are popping up all the time, which is really great. Um, close to here, we have a uh, prairie nursery in Westfield, which is, I believe, online only now. They don't do, they don't have a retail store anymore. Um, J and J Transplant, which is in Wild Rose, they do a lot of wetland species, but they're getting into more and more dry species as well. Um, Generation Natives is a new one in Amherst. That one just really started retail sales last year. Nicole Good is the owner there. She's a Wild Ones member. Um, so that's close by in Amherst. Um, the other big one that I order a lot from is in Winona, Minnesota. It's Prairie Moon Nursery. So that's one you can go to if you have a plant in mind. It doesn't matter what it is, they have it. They have a huge selection of stuff. And you can usually get anything in plugs or in seed. So hard to find things, I tend to go there. J&J uh, &J has a lot of common stuff. And then Prairie Nursery has a huge selection as well. They tend to be more expensive. Um, the owner, Neil, is on radio shows a lot and stuff. So he can command a bigger dollar because people know his name. Uh, he's a very, very smart guy, very well-established business. And they have amazing plants, but he does charge more than some of the other nurseries do. Uh, Nicole is very, um, very affordable in Amherst, Generation Natives. Mm -hmm. um, they are, is it County KK, I think, out there that runs through Amherst? I think she's right on that road. So only 20, 20 minutes, 25 minutes away from here, which is really great. And you can raise your own. Um, our Wild Ones chapter has a seed exchange every November, so you just miss the meeting. Mm -hmm. But we do a, a, a member seed exchange where you can come and get seeds, and we talk about okay. starting plants um, from seed. And a lot of these plants are fairly easy to grow from seed inside. <laughs> and then you can save yourself a bunch of money that way. Um, if you're not ready to take on that commitment yet, you can go buy them from a nursery. And I highly recommend Nicole at Generation Natives because she's so close and very affordable too. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> 20 years ago, we uh, tore up a lot of our lawn and put in what we thought was native landscaping from somebody that helped us do that. And one of the plants that was quite aggressive and kept spreading around is culver's root. And okay. the culver's root <clears throat> is now pushing towards the purple cone flower at one end. And it, I have less and less purple cone flower and more and more culver's root. So I just yank them out and throw them away, but it's tough going. Uh, the other thing is, it's only been about five years since we put in Joe Pie weed, and we really like them. I know they're really tall, but uh, these culvers root go about four to five feet tall. And um, I'd like to, I don't want to use pesticides, but I want to just yank them out or, or, 
and diminish them somewhat and get more Joe Pye weed and more uh, purple coneflower. Do you have any advice for how I could do that? Well, I've been trying to get more Culver's root to grow in my gardens. Um, yeah, are you in are you some, do you have moist so soil? Yeah. Is your soil moist? Well, we sprinkle it. Okay, so that that well, helps. because there's lawn right next to it. Okay, okay, so it doesn't like my dry sand very much. It's it's more of a moisture soil species in the wild. Um, as far as controlling it, I've never dealt with controlling that plant because I'm I'm usually trying to get more of it, not less of it. Um, <laughs> Bob, do you know if it's a rhizomatous species, Culver's root? I don't remember. I don't think so. I don't think so either. So my other thought that came into my head was maybe it was some kind of an ornamental Veronicastrum species instead of the true Veronicastrum virginiatum, which is the native Culver's root. Um, sometimes when you, when you get a native seed mix or you ask someone to plant a native garden, Native means different things to different people. They may have planted things that were native to the Midwest, native to the US, native to Wisconsin. It could mean different things. Um, sometimes that happens with things like Menarda. People plant the scarlet bee ball and the red one, which is native to parts of the Eastern part of the country, not native here. It tends to be more aggressive here than our native bee ball uh, because it's not native here. Um, so that could be going on. If is, is it a white flower that it produces? Yeah. Okay. And, and it so, does attract a lot of insects. Yeah. Uh, so it's probably the native one. It's probably just doing very well because you're because it's being sprinkled. It's kind it of an ideal sprinkled. location for it. Yeah. Um, I would suggest either just yanking it by hand or just cutting it back. Okay. Um, cut it back several times and kind of let the other things around it just grow around it and shade it out. Yeah. And I think that would work over time. Yeah. And the other thing is the prairie smoke, which we put in as our first. Uh, blooming about May and sort of the other ones are later in the season. They're there and there's, you know, after 20 years, but by golly, the weeds and stuff just love to take over where there's prairie smoke. It's not very aggressive. No, it doesn't compete real well. And it's so small. Uh, things can very easily grow around it and shade yeah. it out. Um, when I plant that one, I, I, I put a lot of it in our current house and I, I think I put in like 200 of them in one oh, big yeah, club, nice. which is cool because it, it's so neat when it's in a grouping. It looks cool as an individual one. But when you have 200 of them in seed at once and it's just this fog of pink over the whole patch, it's really cool. And it helps them to exclude weeds and kind of remain as a clump rather than a couple of individuals that get easily crowded out by other things that are taller. Yeah, and don't they, they don't like moist soil nearly as much either. So they might just not be super happy where they're at either. They're more of a sandy species. Yeah. So uh, if it's not an ideal habitat and you've got weeds growing around it, that's just, that's a lot of- we probably aggressive. have 40 of them, but not, not a big group. Okay. Yeah, 40 sounds like a lot, but when it's a plant that's way this big- It's only it's, it's still a small batch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. I think you ought to get together with this gentleman and pull out his colors root and take it home. Yeah, I should. Yeah, I should take some of yours out. I'll be where to go. I'll give you a, yeah. lots of colors. I think my problem is just that it's so sandy and dry that his colors root doesn't want to grow in my my lawn. So <laughs> I could put as much as I want in; it just not, it won't last. There's a, there's a question online: um, When you have a larger native plant started in a pot, does it interfere with the deep tap root? formation, how long is too long to grow in a pot? Yeah, good questions. So um, yes, it can interfere with the taproot development. So if you have a plant like a uh, silphium, cup plant, compass plant, um, prairie dock, things like that, if you let that grow in a pot for more than about six weeks, it will blast out the bottom of the pot. Uh, the taproot will just destroy the pot. Uh, at that point, it becomes hard to plant because you can't get the pot off the plant. Um, the, the second part of that question was how long is too long to grow in a pot, right? So, uh, a few years ago over the winter, I was bored, I guess I did about 110 different, uh, species in the basement, growing them out and photographing them every couple of days. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, it's hard to identify seedlings. And it's hard to know what's a good plant, what's a bad plant, to, to pull, which one should I be pulling out? And I also wanted to know how long should I grow it in a pot in order to 
have it kind of ideal size to move outside in the springtime. If you go out and buy a packet of tomato seeds or parsley seeds or whatever, it'll say right on the packet, start these seeds five weeks before the last frost and then move them outside or harden them off at that point. And nothing was really known about that for native plants. And uh, so I did all these different trials with all these different species. And in general, four to six weeks was kind of the broad answer for pretty much everything. Um, but like right up about five weeks was pretty consistently that this is the, the right time to move them outside. They're not overgrowing their pot. They're not getting too tall and leggy. They're not bursting out of the bottom of the pot. So I would recommend shooting for that. If you're going to start them inside, shoot for a five or six weeks before the last frost and then start slowly moving them outside into the shade, into part sun, hardening them off a little bit. Um, putting a fan on them, keeping them nice and strong. Um, I would recommend not growing them in pots for more than eight or 10 weeks. You certainly can. I know people who have had plants in pots for two or three years and they're still alive, but they're so root bound that they become kind of difficult to, to plant at that point. Okay. Yeah, what do you think of Viper's bug loss? Echium bulgaria. I don't know that one. Oh. Uh, Viper's bug gloss? Viper's bug gloss. Um, okay. In uh, the uh, lake landscape, uh, lakescape over in Michigan, I've seen a lot of it, and the butterflies love it, the insects love it. I don't think it's native, but a pretty okay. blue flower. Okay. It sounds cool. Yeah, it's, it's got a cool, cool name. name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard of that one before. Yeah. You mentioned that winter berry doesn't do well in sandy soil. We also live in Whiting. Is there another kind of tree that has berries that would do well in that soil? Yeah, uh, I, from my, my property in particular, American elderberry is very happy. Uh, it grows well in, in dry sandy soil, especially if it's part shade. Um, the red elderberry is more of a moist soil species. So if you're on the north side or on the west side of the river, that one would do well over there. Um, so I'd say American elderberry is a great option. It's a fairly dense shrub. Uh, it will do well in that habitat and produce a lot of berries for the birds. Um, <coughs> winterberry holly is cultivated as well. So you can sometimes find cultivars that are sort of bred for dry soils. So it's, it's possible. Um, the ones that I was planting in in my old in my old house where the soil was more moist, uh, they were actually plant rescues from a, a place where a guy was planning on digging up a big area of the of the yard. And so I dug them out and I moved them. So they were wild winterberry hollies. Uh, and they weren't real happy in the I tried to move a few when we when we moved, and they didn't like the dry soil. But yeah, I would suggest American elderberry or or looking for, a cultivar maybe of the, the Ilex, the winterberry. Um, I, I would suggest trying to stay with straight species rather than cultivated varieties of, of natives. Um, they do tend to have a little bit less ecological value, even though it's the same species, they've been bred in certain ways, sometimes they lose some of their value. Um, so try to find the straight species and I, I would suggest the elderberry. Can you give us some tips on tarping areas? Um, how, how long you want to tarp down? Like say for instance, I want to plant something in the spring and I, I put a tarp down now. Um, yeah, okay. So putting a tarp down now will do pretty much nothing. Uh, it has to be growing when the, when the plants underneath are trying to grow. If they're all dormant, then it's not going to do much. So you have to do it during the growing season. Um, the hotter and sunnier it is, the better. And the darker your tarp is, the better. So I have tried blue and green and yellow and all these other colors of tarps, silver. Don't use any of those. Don't use brown. It's not close enough to black. It's gotta be black. Um, the darkest, heaviest tarp you can get or a black rubber sheet. Um, Susan has an old billboard. Yes, but I've been Fantastic. The, it's heavy, it's thick, nothing grows through it. It's, it's hard to move. Um, but the heavier and darker it is, the better. So a heavy duty black tarp is the way to go. It's okay if it's silver or brown on the other side, it's gotta be black on the, on the side that's face up. So, so if, if we want to 
do a planting in the spring, how how long should the tarp be down? Um, yep. Would it be ready by June? So the, the planting that I showed at the beginning in my backyard, that was tarped uh, starting in about, um, it was the first week of April, which is kind of early. It's not hot really yet. It's not super sunny and, and it's, it's not gonna cook things as well as it would in June. Um, but I left that on for about five weeks and that was enough. The Piffner Park Shoreline Garden, we put that tarp down as soon as the snow was gone, which again was the first week of April. I think it was actually April 1st. And then we planted, I think on May 8th. So it was about five weeks. Uh, if you have longer than that, I would go longer. But I think five weeks is adequate, especially if it's in the sun. So that site had the west sun hitting it in the springtime, that probably helped. Um, but the five weeks was adequate. We didn't have really any issues with grass there, except right along the edge of the path where the, the tarp and the sandbags left this tiny little gap, there was this little strip of grass there. But everything else was killed very effectively with that tarp, five weeks time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you said the nodding onion was a plant that deer and rabbits don't like. I've tried growing purple cone flowers, which a lot of catalogs say deer don't like, and the deer eat, have eaten every yeah, like flower it. I've ever planted. <laughs> so did they really not eat the nodding onion? Uh, I've had deer walk right past them in our yard. Uh, we probably have four or 500 nodding onions on our property. Deer have never touched them to my knowledge. I've seen rabbits and deer eating common milkweed right next to the nodding onion. Another thing that you, you wouldn't think they would like. I mean, there's a lot of nasty stuff in that sap that the deer really shouldn't be eating, but they still munch it once in a while. Um, and so I, there's there's a gradient there of there's from deer resistant to deer love these. And um, depending on how hungry the deer are, they'll eat just about anything. They certainly will eat cone flowers. That It's not the first thing they go after in my yard. They like the asters first. Uh, blazing stars, they really like eating those but the cone flowers are lower on the list for the deer, but they'll certainly eat them. Nodding onion, I've never seen one eat a nodding onion. Same thing with rattlesnake master, I've never seen him touch that one either. Any other questions online or anything? No, there were no other questions okay. online. I am so, I really love those of you who are taking notes. <laughs> and if you didn't take notes, this is going to be on the Alas YouTube channel in a few days. So if you want to look back and remind yourself later this winter or next spring about um, some of the information here, it'll be right there for you. So. And I'd encourage you to look into the Central Wisconsin Wild Ones chapter too, if you're interested in learning more about native plants. Um, it's a very welcoming group. We have people who are extremely experienced and then people who have never done this before. And it's all just, we're all learning together. So it's a very easy group to get along with. Um, happy to guide people through. We do yard tours so you can see what other people have done um, and just help you get into the enjoying native plant gardening from the very beginning. When and where do wild ones meet? Yeah, so our, our chapter is uh, most of our Members are in Portage County and Wapaka County, but we represent uh, into Washera County, Adams County, Wood County, Marathon County. Meetings are generally in Stevens Point, uh, most of the time at Schmeekley Reserve. So they're right in town. Um, is it a consistent day of the week these days? Thursday, but they're not meeting now until Thursday. tomorrow. Right, so we, we like to say March. we go dormant for the winter. <laughs> uh, and then in March, it comes back. Uh, February is the plant sale month, so if you're interested in starting a new garden next spring, um, we have a chapter plant sale. So we go and actually, we put in a bulk order from a nursery, we go pick them up, we bring them right back to Stevens Point, and then you can pick them up at, at a member's house. We usually have two or three members that take a bunch of the plants and you just tell us which, which place is most convenient for you and that's where your plants will be. So it's an easy way for people to get native plants right in town. Um, so that... Do they have a web page or Facebook yes, page? Yes, I'll get to that in just a sec. So uh, the plant sale, uh, the plants are um, $3 for members and $4 for non-members. So it's an incentive to be a member. 
Um, and then you just pick them up in May. So you pre-order them in February and then pick them up in mid-May. How much are membership dues? $15, 35 15 or 20 35 Is it 35 yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Maybe so. it's 35. Okay. So you go to wildones.org, that's the national website, and then you pick a chapter. So yeah. we're the central Wisconsin chapter. Um, and yeah, you can, with everything, all the member, the, the meetings and stuff are free. There's generally pizza and salad in all the meetings too. Uh, so you're getting, you're getting your money's worth there. You get free dinner. Meetings are a lot of times at 5.30 or 6 o'clock. And so we serve dinner. Um, but yeah, it's a great opportunity to, get involved with data plants and learn a lot of stuff from, from people and see what other people have done. And as far as the website goes, um, there is a Wild Ones, uh, there's a, a chapter web page on the national website, but we also have our own website. Um, easiest way to just be search Central Wisconsin Wild Ones and you'll come up with it that way um, instead of writing down the long address. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Thank you, Paul, right. so much. Thank you. We're going to go dormant for the month of December, but we will be back in January okay. with a program uh, by Craig Zilikowski talking about Alaska and um, conservation issues there. Uh, so he's going to have some great photos uh, from the land, from the ocean, and uh, all things Alaska. And so uh, that should be fun. Let's see what else we have coming up. Um, Christmas bird count. Christmas bird count is happening. Uh, you can contact me uh, if you're interested in helping out with the Amherst count. And Jerry Jans is right here. He's in charge of the Stevens Point. It is December 16th. Yep. A, isn't there a field trip this week, Saturday? Then fill on. Down on the Mississippi. Oh, that was the Mississippi trip happened last Saturday. Oh, was it last week? Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't know. But, but, yeah. uh, let's see. Uh, and then the next field trip is not till February 11th, and that's snowshoeing at Hartman Creek with Bob Craig. Yeah, that's always good. Um, we have a few snacks over here and uh, some juice to sip on if you want to stay and chat for a bit. Um, otherwise, thanks for being here.